And thanks for the organizers for inviting me here to speak today after this uh, excellent lineup of, as I mentioned before, Sitsi All-Stars. It's a little intimidating um, to talk to after people who have such positive data since so much of what I've done in this area has been somewhat ne less positive, let's just say that. Um, also, uh, these folks are true all-stars. I'm at best a SITSI member, and I'm not sure my membership is up to date, so I have to work on that. We'll check on it. Yes, okay, good. So, you've heard a lot about PD-1 and PDL one I thought I'd focus a little bit on biomarker development in that area, as opposed to talking about some of the past. Um, just as a quick summary of where I think we stand right now, is we have an early signal of efficacy based on just uh, phase one trials at the moment. Um, one of the key questions with the uh, data that we've seen is, is the clinical benefit that we've seen in some ways a reflection of patient selection? Or will the stable disease that we've seen in some of these patients translate into improved survival in pivotal trials? That certainly was the case, as Pam mentioned, with ipilimumab. We'll have to see if that's the case with PD-1 and PDL one And also very important, as she mentioned as well, is how many of these responses are durable when we stop therapy? Um, you talk about the tail of the curve, which is what we all care so much about, those folks who actually enter a remission and can come off treatment. Uh, are those responses as durable with PD-1, PD-L1 as we see with IL-2 and IPI? Toxicity is an issue, particularly when you talk about combinations, which is obviously the next step. But what I was asked to focus on is uh, biomarker development, and one fundamental question is, are we ready to guide clinical development or pivotal trials uh, based on biomarkers, particularly PDL1 expression, which has uh, received some attention early on in the development of these drugs? That was largely based on the Topolian New England Medical uh, New England Journal uh, study that was published uh, a while back where we looked at a small, relatively small subset of patients on that trial looking at tumor immunohistochemical expression of PDL1 on the tumor. Essentially, in, in that experience, if there was not PDL1 uh, picked up on the tumor, there were no responses in that group. But it must be emphasized, a very small group of patients, only 42 patients, also a very small group of kidney cancer patients. Um, so we obviously need more data. Uh, one of the interesting things in my mind about ASCO this year was we started to get some more data about the impact of PDL1 expression on response. This is a data from Genentech and their phase one trial of their PDL1 antibody looking at PDL1 uh, staining on the infiltrating um, cells in the tumor. And what you see here is essentially while responses seem to be higher in PDL1 positive tumors, we're still seeing responses in PDL1 negative tumors. So in my opinion, we need a lot more work in this area. We also, I don't think we're ready to exclude patients who are PDL1 negative, particularly in kidney cancer, for reasons that I'll explain. So here's some of the summary uh, data that we've seen so far. I mentioned uh, the uh, PD-1 and PDL1 data. There was also another smaller study, smaller analysis of the melanoma patients on the original um, pivotal trial, looking at 34 patients in that setting. Interestingly, those that were PDL1 positive, were, uh, the, the response rate was higher than we saw in the overall population, but once again, uh, slightly in a different tumor type, responses being seen in PDL1 negative patients. And we'll talk about the combination in a second. So there's quite a few unanswered uh, questions. I'll try to take just a few of them um, as far as the biomarker development, translational questions, which we hope we can address in the coming years. The first one that I decided to pick out is, is PDL1 expression uniform and stable in an individual tumor and from primary to metastases? Um, we've all, this has been cited multiple times at almost every meeting, we cite the, the British group's work uh, from Gerlinger et al. from New England Journal about tumor heterogeneity. In my opinion, this is going to have a large impact on biomarker development with uh, these targeted immune therapies. Um, he, Gordon already showed this slide. Uh, I'll make a slightly different point than he made. We're looking at, uh, this is Sabina Signoretti's uh, lab looking at his PDL1 IHC antibody, looking at uh, concordance in some patients between primary and metastases, but discordance in other cases. We've started to look at a group of primary and matched um, met pairs. These are not uh, biopsy samples. These are surgical excisions on patients. We obviously have to do this in a much larger group of uh, patients, and we're glad to collaborate with folks who can um, provide samples. Um, but we've looked at in those 34 patients, we had 10 um, patients who were PDL1 positive by their assay. But in seven out of 10 of those patients, 
the, the MET was positive and three, it, it was uh, negative. Also, we saw some patients where the primary was negative and the MET was positive, so there may be some discordance in patients. Interestingly, she found that in the primary, PDL1 staining was quite heterogeneous. It tended to be in areas of high uh, nuclear grade, but in the MET, the staining was more homogeneous. So how does this impact uh, biomarker development? It's possible in our early experiments, we need to be sampling both the primary and the metastasis and I would argue that we, we need to consider all these hard slide, uh, these trials are hard to execute, Look, getting, trying to get excisional uh, tissue so we can see a more comprehensive view of what the tumor is doing. Um, another question is what factors, in addition to pdl one the expression can reliably predict response to treatment. You know, so for example, why do some PD-L1 uh, negative patients actually respond to a PD-1 antibody? I think Gordon uh, mentioned this as well, and it, it may be as simple potentially as PD-L2. If, and, and Sabina has shown in the, here's a case example of one patient's tumor in the bottom here who, that does not have PD-L1 on its uh, surface, but does express PD-L2. So could that be a possible explanation for why PD-L1 one, patients don't respond, are they just expressing PDL2? That needs to be explored. This antibody needs to be refined and tested in much larger groups of patients. Another un unanswered question is um, Is predictive uh, marker expression influenced by prior VEGF therapy? Um, it's an, I think it's an interesting question. And does it, respond, does it predict for a response to this therapy? So, for example, are VEGF uh, therapies, which are so common, more active in PDL1 positive patients? Um, I, I sort of alluded to the IL-2 SELECT trial that we mentioned um, before as a sort of a negative experience um, in biomarker development and immune um, therapy and kidney cancer. Here's a look at the same cohort of patients. We looked briefly at whether pdl one expression and uh, B7H3 expression, this was the help with Eugene Kwan and Brad uh, Leibovich at the Mayo Clinic. And essentially, in our hands, um, the PDL1, and when it was up in your tumor, or B7H3 is up in your tumor, you are more likely to respond to IL2. Obviously, that needs to be confirmed in a prospective uh, data set. Um, but more important to the point that I was trying to make, sub, sub, most of these patients did not um, get cured with IL-2, surprisingly, um, but they went on to other therapies. Um, and one of the things we tried to look at is whether staining impacted their uh, response to those other therapies, and it turns out that group um, was probably a little bit less likely to benefit from VEGF TKIs. Other groups have published uh, similar results in this area. Uh, GSK presented a trial at ASCO, which I would have shown you as the next slide, except Dr. Schwery forgot to give it to me, um, unfortunately. <laughs> but it shows a similar experience. Thank you, Dr. Schwery. All right, moving on. So he's busy. So PD-1 blockade, one, uh, another question uh, um, which I'd like to see us pursue is PD-1 bl blockade better applied in the treatment naive setting or in the VEGF pathway resistance setting? Um, one trial that um, Mike Atkins is trying to uh, launch is trying to get at some of these questions, try to help address some of these issues, both clinical and uh, translational. This is a uh, phase two trial where patients would get uh, their primary uh, tumor uh, sampled, uh, they'd also get a baseline tumor biopsy of a metastasis that would be excisional. They'd be then randomized to, uh, randomized to VEGF, uh, VEGF TKI or a PD-1 antibody. Um, and then at the time of progression, undergo a, a second uh, excisional biopsy. In the case of the VEGF TKI patients, they probably could be um, biopsied because that would then allow them to go on to get the PD-1 antibody, which patients are obviously highly motivated to get. This trial, this tri type of trial design is hard to execute, um, but I think given the interest in PD-1 antibodies at the moment, it, it might be possible and might help address some of these issues, not just on predictive biomarkers and the impact of VEGF therapy on those biomarkers, but some of the mechanistic questions that have been alluded to about why some of these agents work and, and why may, they may not work in some patients. A um, last question uh, that I had here is, you know, what, what are some of the mechanisms of resistance? Obviously, just like with um, IL-2 and ipilimumab, the patients getting a, a, a long benefit with PD-1, PD-L1 are obviously just a subset of the entire group. You know, why is that? You know, how can we look at both an innate and acquired uh, resistance to PD-1 uh, pathway blockade? There are quite a few potential mechanisms of in innate resistance. This is sort of a, a long list. I won't go over it all because it's just, um, you know, I don't have too much time, but I'd like to focus on, you know, one of the potential mechanisms for innate resistance, you know, could it be that in tumors where exhausted T cells or inhibitory T cells predominate, that approaches to activate uh, T cells like IL-2, 
or target uh, inhibitory molecules like TIM3 and LAG3, as you've heard from other speakers, or deplete regulatory T cells, as ipilimumab might do, could those things be necessary in those patients to overcome innate resistance? Um, this is a look, um, it, once again, from Sabina, Sabina Signoretti, looking at co-expression of T-cell inhibitory pathways in uh, kidney cancer specimens. This is looking at T-cells. And essentially what this shows is T-cells in the tumor both expressing PD-1, uh, TIM-3 um, at the same time. So it's conceivable that you need to have, you need to be blocking both of these antibodies, uh, both of these targets or other targets, as other people have mentioned, to get a full uh, a response. So we do see this in some specimens. Um, Genentech has made a great effort at trying to look at some of these mechanistic questions in their recent uh, phase one trial that I mentioned before, where patients um, with access to tissue were asked to get, undergo serial biopsies. This is looking at a serial biopsy of a kidney cancer patient. Unfortunately, many of our patients don't have easily biopsyable disease, but this person obviously did with a mass under their arm. You can see the response um, happening uh, fairly quickly, um, but also probably more interesting is you can see some changes which are characteristic of a responding patient with T-cell CD8 positive uh, infiltrate in this specimen um, sample taken at the second biopsy. Obviously you know, coming up with situations where we can do that effectively in kidney cancer is going to be harder than it is, say, in melanoma. But another potential place where we could uh, test it is in the neoadjuvant setting, as Chuck mentioned, and I think as Naomi Haas mentioned earlier this morning. Um, and that's something we're trying to uh, develop in the uh, cooperative group setting, looking at a neoadjuvant application of uh, PD-1 blockade. So this has been mentioned several times. I won't belabor this because this is the recent New England Journal paper of looking at combinations. Uh, the point is not that this is the greatest data since um, oncology started, because it is. Um, but, but more importantly, the biomarker part of this story, um, we saw increased responses than with single agent PD-1. We saw increased toxicity, um, as been, has been pointed out by at least one speaker. But I wanted to focus a little bit on the, um, on the biomarker piece of this story. I, as I mentioned to you before, PD-L1 expression has been associated with higher response rates, but it's not perfect at excluding non-responders. One of the interesting uh, pieces of this trial was that the response rate in PD-L1 negative and PD-L1 positive patients was robust in both groups. And that begs the question, which maybe we can address with the uh, after with the uh, with the with the speakers here is you know what's going on there in a PDL1 negative patient what is CTLA4 blockade doing to that tumor microenvironment that are making those patients responders but that was an exciting application in my mind of uh, biomarker development that hopefully will lead to, uh, to future insights so as as we move forward, you know, there's a lot of exciting new things to do, as, as many people have said. It's, you know, it's great that people are, are showing interest in immune therapy, and I certainly hope it uh, continues. A lot of different uh, combinations that, that, that make sense, but only with rational trial design and uh, biomarker development are we going to be able to move this path forward, um, particularly when we have active agents in the clinic when you think about clinical uh, development. So we're going to have to narrow our population, narrow our application of these agents uh, to the proper patient in order to move these combinations forward, in my opinion, um, so that we can achieve Dr. Finke's dream of more cures for kidney cancer with uh, targeted immunotherapy. Thank you very much for your attention.